Thank you, Wynn. We have many metaphors for God. And this solo talks about the wind of God refreshing us, but then encouraging us to get up and move on. A grandfather tells this story. He says, when my grandson and I entered our vacation cabinet, our vacation cabin, we kept the lights off until we were inside to keep from attracting pesky insects. Still, a few fireflies followed us in. Noticing them before I did, Billy whispered, it's no use, Grandpa. Now the mosquitoes are coming at us with flashlights. Well, I'm going to suggest today that we have been nourished by God and now maybe we need to be pesky mosquitoes with flashlights against the evil in our world. For the last four weeks, the sermons have been about bread and feasting at the table. And when I looked at the lectionary reading for today, I couldn't believe it. It started with Jesus saying what we heard last week, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. This is the bread that came down from heaven. You know, enough is enough. Hopefully we've gotten that message. We have been nourished by the presence of Jesus to Christ. But now that we are full of Jesus as well as wisdom's table, what do we do? You know, many of us really want to take a nap after we've had a large meal, but we need to get up from Jesus' table and take action. Our table prepared today is a table of being responsive to God's love by going out and helping others, by doing justice by showing mercy. We can't continue to sit at the table. We need to take action. So I was thankful that at least Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, talks about action. And he has two images in this scripture lazing about action. One of them is to take up the whole armor of God as a Roman soldier. The people he were writing to knew exactly what the armor of a Roman soldier was, okay? But it's kind of bizarre. At the same time he says, take up the armor of God, he ends it by saying, I am in prison in chains, and yet I am an ambassador of the good news of the gospel. The New Testament is full of paradoxes. And the paradox here is to take action means both. It means to take up the armor of God and be willing to be in chains as we are an ambassador. Bruce Eppley, a progressive Christian commentator, writing this week about this passage from Ephesians says this, put on the whole armor of God, put on God's armor of light. We need to be strong to face the demons within and without that have let loose in the world. Whether or not you believe in the reality of demonic powers, the powers and the principalities. There is a war out there. You can see the forces of evil moving into battle, some with Confederate flags, some waging war on immigrants and marriage equality, some denying or dismissing Pope Francis' encyclical on global climate change. Paul talks about demons both internal 
and external. So Bruce absolutely continues by saying, we need to recognize the need to protect ourselves from both internal and external forces. Many of us are imprisoned by anxiety, depression, trauma, family of origin issues, and or the impact of religious ritualistic abuse. These powers are often greater than we can bear and threaten to undermine our spiritual and emotional integrity. Our only hope in responding to these evils is found in trusting God for our healing and sustaining and aspiring to live by the highest and best despite the challenges of life. We also need a community to uphold us in prayerful support. No one is ever saved alone. We need a cloud of witnesses, a community of love to sustain us in life's challenges. So we have the armor of God. We don't have time to explore all the images that Paul presents here but I'd like to focus on three. The shield of faith, the shoes used to proclaim the gospel of peace, and the sword of the spirit. Now, in Roman times, the shield was made out of wood and covered with leather, and it was wet, because oftentimes the enemy would send down flaming arrows. So it was a defensive mechanism to prevent these arrows from doing much damage. What's interesting is these shields were very loud, very large. They not only covered the whole person, but they covered a third of the person next to them. So, you know, we have these terrible images of police in some of these violent outbreaks with all the shields lined up. But that's what the Romans did. The shields were interconnected. And I think that's an interesting metaphor of what the church is all about. We have our individual shield of faith, but by connecting them together, it is stronger and more powerful. Look at our hymns for today. A mighty fortress is our God. The old version says, a bulwark never failing. The one we sang today says, our, st our strong and sure protection. We'll be singing after the sermon, come God creator, be our shield. We have been fed by Jesus we are nourished and protected from the evil forces within and without. Most of the armor that Paul describes is defensive, is protected. And the one message we have being taking on the whole armor of God is that we are protected. And using the previous sermons, we have been nourished by God. But that's not enough. We now need to put on the shoes. Now, the Roman soldiers' shoes were basically sandals with very thick soles. And they were used to be prepared for long marches, oftentimes into enemy territory. You know, shoes and boots are made for walking. And so Paul says, we need to stand up and get moving. We need to stand firm. You cannot put on the whole armor of God if you're still sitting at the table. Okay? Now, now that we're standing and we're walking and proclaiming the gospel of peace, we need an offensive weapon. 
Christians should not be passive. We need to be active in resisting the forces of evil. So we have the sword, but not the Roman sword forged and made of steel, but God's sword that, according to Paul, is made of the Holy Spirit. The sword of love, the sword of compassion, the sword of caring. So, we are protected by God's shield, and we can nurture that in contemplation, in silence, in prayer, in group worship, okay? But now that we are protected, we need to put on the shoes and spread the gospel of peace using the sword of the Holy Spirit, which is the sword of love and compassion. Sounds good, but wait. What about the other image in this passage? The image that Paul presents as an ambassador in chains who is going to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. You know, Paul is somewhat of a, a malign person by many progressive Christians. But the reality is, he was a mystic. When he encountered the living Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, he was a changed person. God was in him, and he then had this shield of faith that was powerful. So he had been imprisoned at least three or four times, and tradition has it that he was probably beheaded in Rome after his last imprisonment. Now, to be in chains in the ancient world was pretty terrible. Both the weight and the way people were chained made the chains very painful and could result in permanent damage to one's limb. As New Testament scholar Fem Perkins writes and that, he says, in Paul's time, that to speak of an ambassador in chains would be an oxymoron. A wretched, dirty creature in chains could hardly make the rhetorical show necessary to accomplish the task of ambassador. And yet, this is what it is. Paul was a very powerful ambassador spreading the gospel of peace. Let's move forward to three years ago. Most of us have heard about the Transform Now plowshares activity that took place down the road in Knoxville about three years ago when three persons, Sister Megan and lay brothers Greg and Michael, broke in to the facility. They wanted to heal and transform the building where nuclear material for bombs is made and stored. They wanted to transform it with their own blood, to mark it as a symbol of evil empire and war, to protest against its role in maintaining America's nuclear army. So armed with flashlights, which is better than fireflies, they, they went about a, more than a quarter of a mile, cut through two chain link fences, and it's kind of bizarre, they expected much more trouble getting in than they did, and all of a sudden, they were there at this building. Soon, the white walls of the building were decorated with spray paint and blood with the words, work for peace, not war. They, they hammered off a little chunk of the building symbolically to say, we're going to destroy this building. They placed crime scene tape across it because from their perspective as ambassadors of peace, nuclear war preparation is, in fact, a crime. 
they placed Bibles and white roses on the ground. The, the white roses were to commemorate the white rose, a German student group, a German student group that had opposed Hitler and promoted nonviolent resistance. So they did their action, and they waited half an hour singing songs, including this little light of mine, let it shine all around Y12. Eventually somebody came, okay? And the, the first person who came really was kind of, what's going on here, but approached them in a fairly gentle fashion. But then when it was realized that this huge security breach had been, had been executed by these very meek and mild people, all heck broke loose, okay? And they brought in the reinforcements. Uh, the three of them were handcuffed, put on the ground for at least three or four hours, eventually taken to jail, uh, indicted, prosecuted, convicted to fairly long jail sentences. The good news is that, very unexpectedly, in May, I believe it was, for whatever reason, the legal system decided they shouldn't be in prison, and they were released. And they, and they got this news all of a sudden. However, they still do face one more criminal charge, I think it's for sabotage, which they'll be facing in, in the fall. I think a close look at these three saints will give us an idea of what it means to be armored with the faith of God, but also willing to be imprisoned in chains. A couple of weeks ago, six of us from this church went to uh, Knoxville and heard Sister Megan and Brother Craig and Michael speak. And then the next day, Terry and I went to a demonstration against the, uh, the Y-12 building. And I had a chance to experience these three people up front and in person. And what I'm going to share is a combination of my reaction to these giants, as well as information from an article written by uh, Paul Schlosser, I'm sorry, Eric Schlosser in this March New Yorker's magazine. Let's start with Sister Megan. She is now 85 and was 82 at the time of the break-in. And walking that quarter mile up to the facility was kind of hard in her, but she, but, but she made it, okay? You know, she would fit right in here in our community in Uplands. Uh, she would, spent 30 years in Africa as a missionary, came back, and she has been arrested probably four or five dozen times. And this break-in was her idea, okay? But to me, what I read and then experienced personally was that Sister Megan really represents what it means to be a mystic. When she was testifying in court, she said that I have this profound love of all of nature and I believe a belief in the interconnectedness of everything. And that's the essence of what it means to be a mystic to be so, so filled with the wonder and awe of God that we all become one and everything is in, interconnected. And because everything is interconnected, having bombs being made at Y-12 was, was evil. I was aware that of every moment being an imminent, an imminent threat to the life and harmony of the planet. But to see Sister Megan in person is to be in the presence of somebody who has something special. Her eyes sparkled, and she really exuded radiant joy. 
She was like Paul. She had experienced the living presence of Jesus and it made her different and ready for action. When she was talking to us uh, at uh, the, the, the session on Friday evening, she talked mainly about her experience in, in, in jail. She was, the, the, the woman's prison had been converted to a man's prison, so she was stuck in a detention center in a dormitory style room with 60 beds about a foot apart. Okay, can you imagine being in a room with 60 people confined? And she says that at times the room got shrieking loud. Okay. But being armored with God's faith and a mystical awareness of what it needs to be active, while she was in prison, she spent most of her time talking to, ministering to, and hearing the stories of the other women in the prison or in the detention center. And now she's become a very strong advocate for prison reform. So we have the mystic, okay? And then Greg, who is probably in his late 50s, is a very soft-spoken, gentle, and humble person. In fact, before they talked in, at, at uh, the Church of the Savior, I was looking around, who are these three people, okay? And I saw this one guy over in the corner, and I said, boy, that guy really looks wimpy, okay? That's really what my, what my, what my, what my impression was. It was, he just was kind of just back there, very, very quiet. Well, it turns out it was, it, it, it was great, you know. When he's not in prison, he works at a Catholic worker, Catholic worker house in Duluth, and he paints houses. This very gentle soul said that in Leavenworth, the prisoner he was, that it was highly segregated, the whites and the blacks. Well, he ate at the only, quote, mixed table, which really were kind of the losers who didn't fit into either group. But he, again, with armored with the faith of God, was ministering within the prison. Now, when Eric Schlosser interviewed him for his article, he writes, as I listen to Greg talk, about his faith and his devotion to nonviolence, it became clear that deep down he was harder and tougher than most of the inmates in the yard. Thoreau spent a single night in jail as an act of civil disobedience and then wrote a famous essay about it. Greg has already spent more than a thousand days, a thousand nights behind bars for his beliefs and it's probably going to be spend many more. He's been in and out of jail for the last 20 years. That is his calling. But he seems to have no regrets. Greg told this author, you must live your Christian beliefs fully, as though judgment may come at any time. So in his soft, gentle way, Greg shows how it is to be in chains in prison, but to have the full armor of God. Now, the last of the trio is Michael. When I heard him speak on Friday evening, I was kind of taken back about his clarity, but his persistence that our government was a war criminal. On Saturday, after the demonstration we had, I was walking back, talking to Greg, I'm sorry, to Michael, and uh, he was awesome in his intensity and his focus. You know, he was a high school dropout, a Vietnam War veteran who came back and realized that to be a Christian you must be nonviolent. He became a pacifist, but a militant pacifist. 
okay? If that's not an oxymoron, okay? And he walks and he talks with intensity. I included in today's bulletin one of my favorite passages from Gandhi, where he talks about, I know the path, it is straight and narrow. I weep, I, I rejoice when I walk on it, I weep when I s slip. Well, Michael reminded me of someone who would do well with Gandhi and his nonviolent movement because of the intensity and the focus. He is crystal clear that we are engaging in war crimes and his actions uh, civil, of civil disobedience are not only legal but morally required. So I had an awesome experience with these people. The Sunday morning study class is looking at nonviolence. And I kind of made, I've only made two appearances there, but I was taken by the power of the readings that we've had. And one of them was a sermon by Dr. Martin Luther King, which he talks about loving your enemy. And the essence or the necessity of forgiveness, of seeing the good in the enemy, of trying to become the friend of the enemy. And thinking about forgiveness, I recently came across this story about St. Francis, and I'd like to share this with you as our conclusion. Once in wintertime, it is said that Francis and his disciple Brother Leo were making a hard journey on foot through the snowy countryside of Italy. They had been walking in silence, because that's what uh, brothers do for a long time when Brother Leo turned to Francis and asked him, how can we find perfect joy? Francis stopped and replied, even if all of our friars were perfect in the holiness and could work all kinds of miracles for others, we still would not have perfect joy. He turned and walked on and Brother Leo ran after him. Then what is perfect joy? Well, Francis st uh, stopped again. Even if we could speak with the birds of the air and the beasts of the field and know all the secrets of nature, we would still not have perfect joy. Even if we could cure all the ills and the face of the earth, we still not have found perfect joy. And then Brother Leo was practically shouting then please, Father Francis, what is the secret of perfect joy? Francis' reply was, well, brother, suppose we go to that monastery across the field and tell the gatekeeper how weary and cold we are. And he calls us tramps and beats us and throws us out into the winter night. Then, brother, if we can say with love in our hearts, bless you in the name of Jesus, then we shall have found perfect joy. To have the armor of God, but the willingness to forgive our neighbor when we're beaten and thrown out in the cold, that is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. So be it.